Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Um, today we are here to uh, have the first of two days of great events uh, related to the I Goodman Cohen lectures. And, and we, so what I wanted to do to start with is to thank Ina Cohen and Dennis Cohen who are here uh, on behalf of the Cohen family. And um, th th this lecture is something of a great tradition here at the law school. So um, it's named after Ike Goodman Cohen who was a prominent trial lawyer and was also the president of the Michigan Trial Lawyers Association which is now known as the Michigan Association for Justice. Uh, he was very active in legal and civic circles uh, in this community uh, here in Michigan. And upon his death in 1978, the Cohen family established this lecture series. Uh, and and we, we, every year, get a chance to celebrate his legacy uh, with great conversations that focus on trial advocacy. This year, we're especially lucky because we actually had two, two days in a row of, of uh, lectures uh, for the Ag Goodman Cohen lecture series. And, so um, in, in a minute, I'm going to pass it off to Bob Sedler, who's going to introduce today's uh, discussion. But I, I just want to just take a, a, an extra special moment here to thank Ina Cohen and Dennis Cohen uh, for being here. And uh, so, so Ina is a, is a lawyer in Michigan and is a, an alumni of our law school. Uh, Dennis is not a lawyer, but he comes in from Los Angeles every year to uh, attend this event. And I, I, I just want to take a moment to give him a round of applause. And now I'd like to introduce Bob Sutler, the senior professor here at the law school, who will introduce the, the, the um, presentations for today. So, Bob, it's all yours. Uh, it's a my privilege for now a number of years to work with Dennis and Ida in putting together the I Goodman Cohen Lecture. It's gone through various emanations. We brought in academics, we brought in lawyers. We've concluded that the most effective way is to bring in real lawyers. Uh, and this is what I mean, I Goodman Cohen, as uh, Lance said, was a real lawyer and believed very much in trial. We have two lawyers today who believe very much in trial. Uh, Deborah Gordon uh, is going to uh, go first. She's been specialized, specialized in employment and civil rights for more than 30 years. She had been assistant attorney general with the Michigan uh, Commission on uh, Civil Rights Division, but she has had her own practice for a long period of time. She is a graduate of the University of Detroit uh, of Mercy, and some of her cases have involved incredible challenges, such as winning an employment discrimination case for a woman's basketball game that would, that would have been virtually unheard of. Uh, she's going to talk, she's going to talk about 15 minutes or so, and Alice Jennings uh, was in Wayne Grant, class of 1978. Why is that so special? That's the first year that I was in Wayne, the class of 77, 78 uh, year. Now, she has been involved in numerous civil rights and employment cases. Um, right now, she's the lead attorney in a national team representing Detroit residents who have had their water shut off. And she has done just a number of other cases, uh, suing the governor, uh, bringing one uh, after another. So each of our panelists will speak for about 15 minutes or so. We're going to keep this very informal. But then we want to turn it over to you for your questions, most of your questions. We don't have anybody going around with mics which means that when you ask a question, ask it very loudly so that everyone in the room can hear it. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to present Dr. Gordon. Hi, everybody. I'm thank you very much for coming during a busy day. 
Yes, Alice and I are war horses. We are, we've been in the courtroom a lot. You feel fine these days, I'm sure you've heard this. You know, trials are on the wane, but some of us are still out there. I very, very much believe in the jury system, and I very much believe in trials as a way to get justice. Um, I do only plaintiff side, which I think Alice is in the same situation I am. That means we select our own cases. We are not paid by the hour. We get paid on a contingency fee basis if we win only. So that's totally unique and different from people that are our opponents who are getting paid by the hour and work at law, typically large corporate law firms or large institutions. So what does that mean for me as a trial lawyer? My areas of the law are all civil rights, all kinds of discrimination under federal, federal and state law, the Whistleblower Protection Act, and then this broad category of constitutional violations under 42 U.S.C. 1983 and 1985, where we're suing police officers, we're suing governmental entities for violating people's civil rights. So that's the job that I have to do, and I have to figure out how I'm going to get a case and how I'm going to make it work at the end of the day. What is unique legally about what I do and also Alice? These are intentional claims, people. This is not somebody negligently ran a stop sign. Okay? That's a whole different kettle of fish if you're trying to show whether somebody accidentally ran a stop sign. We have to show that somebody actually intended to violate your civil rights. Now, nobody comes in and says, oh yeah, I, I wanted to violate the civil rights. Obviously, it's the opposite. These cases are very personal. You're accusing people of discriminating on the basis of race or gender or sexually harassing someone or you're accusing the police department of falsely arresting people. They're going to deny it up one side and down the other. So, case selection is crucial. Crucial, crucial. And here is my tip. Here's the way I've worked this out where I've been successful. The truth, the, the key to winning in the cases I do is having the truth on my side. I have to have the truth on my side. If I don't have the truth, I'm not going to be bothered with it. It's an utter waste of my time and, of course, resources. So I, I talk to my clients, I get a gut reaction, let's assume I've decided to take the case. The things I'm going to look at in taking the case, in addition to is the truth on my side, are twofold. Is there liability and are there damages? Is there liability, has the law been broken and can I prove it? And secondly, has my client been damaged? Okay, so now I've got my three things. The truth is on my side, a law has been broken, and I've got some damages. Now I'm going to get going. So instead of walking you through, through from a chronological point of view, what I do, I'm going to jump to the end. And I'm going to show you what all of the hard work that we put in for sometimes two, three years before we hit the courtroom, where it ends up. And I'm going to talk to you about a case I had against the Detroit Tigers, Olympia Aviation, and uh, Illich, uh, Illich Corporation um, roughly 15 years ago where I represented a flight attendant on the Olympia Aviation plane that flies the Tigers in the summer and the Red Wings in the winter. And it was a sexual harassment case. Now, interesting to start off to this, my client who was a flight attendant, zero problem with the wings. Great people, gentlemen, a pleasure to service them on the plane. Tigers, the opposite. So, I brought some storyboards with me that I actually used in trial, and I'm going to show you what happened and what I did here. So first, I talked about the truth and having the truth on your side. So how does that look? Well, first, let's see what my client said happened. This is what my client said happened on the Detroit Tigers team plane. Okay? She serviced these guys going to and from games, and these were some of the words that were used to her on the plane. Bitch, the bitch, fucking bitch, stupid bitch, dumb bitch, cunt, dumbass, cooter pie, air pie, hide. Pictures of pornography were there, uh, including bestiality on their laptops. Um, would you give your husband a blowjob, Lisa? Would you give your husband a blowjob in a fan? Would you give your husband a blowjob? 
blah, 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 blah. So this is what my client tells me. These are her words, right? I'm not going to have the tiger tell me that they said this. So this is what I'm working with, guys. What do I do with it? And I just walk into court and put her on the stand and be done and done? Obviously not. So the second thing that was important to me was developing the background in this case and figuring out a way to get the evidence in the door of my office and then eventually in front of the jury. So, one of our theories was, in this case, that the reason all this was going on, this is back in Brad Austin, the player, because I don't think anybody remembers what year that is, I don't, but um, Brad Austin was a player, and uh, Bobby Higginson was on the team, and the picture was fixed. So, we knew that part of the whole theory was that they were all usually drunk on their rear ends, and that beer was flowing in the clubhouse and on that plane. So I wanted to get this nailed down so this would go with the, with the alcohol, right? And the jury would understand this is how this all occurred. So the players were deposed. And of course, we would say to them, well, are you drunk on the plane? Rather, and these things, what's good about this case, and this is, every case has its unique fun stuff. You know, these are big time baseball players, and they can't be bothered with my deposition. Right? So they're just going to roll up on in there, you know, haven't given much thought, and they're just going to start talking about their lives. So here was some of the testimony I got in deposition. So this is under oath, and you can use it uh, in a courtroom. You can read it to the jury and cross-examine them with it. So here was fit. Here's what I showed the jury with the, the, the top of the board. There are no rules. It's our plane. So why is this important? It's important because under Title VII, the Civil Rights Act, you have to show that the employer knew about the sexual harassment that was going on. Okay? So I had to create a, um, the whole backstory to what was happening here. And I won't go over all of it with you, but here you can see our literal quotes from the deposition. And here was fifth. The clubhouse managers provide beer in the clubhouse after the game. There is no rule limit in how much beer can be consumed. The players drink alcohol on the bus between the clubhouse and the plane. It's the rookie's job to make sure there is beer on the bus. There was beer and liquor on the plane. There was no limit on the number of drinks. There were really no rules. It's our plane. And then this was a, um, this is another when Phil Gardner was manager. Manager Phil Gardner never came to the back of the airplane. That was ours, the front was the manager. So this is all achieved in depositions. And now I've got this nailed down. This is the atmosphere. Now I need to tell the jury. Okay, great. We've got the beer. We've got the sexual harassment. What does the company know? Okay, my client has said she complained to her boss and people up higher, the director of this whole company. So now I've got to figure out how I'm going to show the jury that the big boys knew. And there's more deposition testimony. Here was the lead flight attendant, Chris Brown, who was also on the plane. And he testified when I reported something to my superiors, it didn't go anywhere. It was a no-win situation. Here's the big boss. He runs Olympia Aviation. And you see the, the handle of the plane. I recall Lisa and others complaining on numerous occasions about player behavior. She complained about harassing behavior. Robbie Minardi was her immediate supervisor. He was aware of it. I saw Lisa obviously upset. So this is how you develop your case. You take witness by witness and you feed them um, information you have in a pleasant and questioning way, unless it's important to get nasty and try to make somebody know you think they're a complete liar. And lo and behold, things start coming out. And finally, with this guy, he just flat out said, apparently I did let somebody harass her. I should have done a better job. Okay? So now this is part three of my case. Now I'm going to go to part four. Now I've got the sex harass harassing language. I've got the deer on the plane. I've got Lisa reporting it. Now let's see what they did after she reported it. Back to the players. Bobby Higginson. No one from the Tigers organization has ever gone 
federal policy or rules concerning sex harassment. No one from the Congress organization ever asked me about Lisa Kevin's complaints. And it continues. So now I've got my four pieces of the puzzle. And like so often in these cases, I'm standing here wondering, why am I in the courtroom? What does Olympia Aviation not understand about these words that come out of their uh, people's mouths? It's pretty clear at this point, and um, I know the jury is going to, you know, yeah, now what was my main concern with this case? Detroit Tigers. You know, these are local stars and heroes. You know, the Illichs, Marion Illich testified in my case. Marissa Illich testified. So that was my worry, was that the personality and the public figure thing might undercut my case. But as I have so often found, juries are and juries are looking for the Now, after you put in your, got my stuff, right? I've got my facts, I've got my story, I think I've proven everything. Okay, that's not going to get me everywhere I need to go. Because the jury is going to get jury instructions. <coughs> This is a different case right here. This is Kevin Fisher versus UPS. This is a race and retaliation case in federal court. Juries take their job very seriously. And I'm going to put all this together, and then the judge is going to tell the jury what they have to do back in the jury room. They're not just going to throw a number out of the hat. They're going to follow this rule book. And it's going to tell them what the law is and how they find that the law was broken. So. I've learned over the years, do not miss an opportunity to hammer home these jury instructions to the same. I've given them evidence. Now I have to tie these things together. And I have to give them a road map. I can't just hope that when they get back into the jury room, they're going to manage to tie these instructions up to what I've just done. So we don't have a lot of time, but I want to show you a few ways that I the jury instructions. I show the jury the jury instructions. Um, back in the day, I used to use board, and now a lot of stuff is, you know, all digital. There's some really good Michigan jury instructions that are standard and that are used in all of our cases. So this is one thing for the area of law I work in that's pivotal. Because remember, it's intentional. What kind of evidence can the jury consider? Direct? Circumstantial. How do they weigh out? So the, the jury instruction on circumstantial is here's what how the standard one reads. Okay, members of the jury, here's what circumstantial evidence is. You're sitting in this courtroom and somebody comes in here and they've got a raincoat on and it's dripping with water. Okay, that's circumstantial evidence that it's been raining outside. It's not direct, you don't see the rain, but it's circumstantial. Now, under Michigan law and federal law, circumstantial evidence is just as important as direct evidence. So I'd like to take this jury instruction and be sure the jury knows this, because most of my cases deal with circumstantial evidence. Two and two make four. Nobody tells you four, but two and two make four. And here's the important stuff. You can see I've got this in red. A fact may be proven indirectly by other facts or circumstances from which you usually and reasonably follow according to common experience and observation of mankind. So I say to the jury, just use your common sense. This is called circumstantial evidence, which you are to consider. Okay? That's one for somebody that's on the plaintiff's side that's got an uphill battle because you want that instruction. Now, this is another really sweet instruction because the juries are like, oh my God, I'm in this courtroom and I've got these jury instructions and it's also formal. But let's look at this. Jurors may take into account ordinary experiences and observations. Members of the jury, here's what the Michigan jury, uh, standard jury instruction says. You have a right to consider all the evidence in the light of your own general knowledge and experience in the affairs of life and to take into account whether any particular evidence seems reasonable and probable. Hmm. Now if you're on the jury, you're like, oh, I can use my common sense. And I think 
I, I know what I just saw. And it turns out I don't need any magic to find for the plaintiff. It's pretty straightforward. And then the other one I like to use, because defendants in my cases always get up and lie. That's what they do. They come up with an alternative story. So this is a good instruction. It's not a standard instruction, but a lot of judges will give it. Uh, you may find that plaintiff's gender was a motivating factor in defendant's decision. If it has been proved by a preponderance of the evidence that defendant's stated reason for its decision is not the true reason, but is a pretext. Makes, makes sense? They're telling the jury, hey, if these people are just making it up, you can use that all by itself to find in favor of the plaintiff. So, the way I approach this is, Gather all your evidence and don't leave anything on the floor with regard to your roadmap. Okay. Um, how to get all this together is probably another lecture discussion, okay? And you've got to be strategic in everything you do. The one thing I can leave you with, and then Alice will, will add her thoughts, is uh, these depositions are absolutely crucial to get people in under oath to be well prepared and ready for whatever they can do with. And then when I'm in trial, I don't ask typically a single question of a witness that I don't have the deposition page on my legal pad next to my question. Every death page is there. Unusual for me to ask a question that I don't have a way to go after this person if he or she says something different to the jury than what they've already told me. And I can promise you, it's extremely effective. But it means you've got to go over every line of every death before you set foot in the courtroom and get your, your big picture together. With that, I'll turn it over to Alice and look forward to your questions. Because I've gathered so many 
books and documents and gadgets and widgets from different companies and over the 30, almost 40 years of practice uh, now here. Uh, it's been a little while, as they say. And so when the phone rings, which is generally the way we obtain a case, telephone rings, calling Edwards and Jennings, and everybody's in crisis. Nobody's calling my office because they just want to talk to me. They are calling because something catastrophic or something very heart-wrenching has happened to them at work. And so our office has set up almost like a triage, almost medical precision to how we handle that very troubled person calling into the office. We want to know whether or not immediately you've got a case. Has your statute of limitations run? You've got to really set parameters for client expectations very early in the process. So many of the defendants now have created arbitration as an alternative to the three-year statute of limitation or the period of time when a person can bring a lawsuit, they've limited witnesses. So one of the first things you have to determine is, is this person outside of their statute of limitations? If they are, you want to make sure that you let them know that right away and then send them on their way. It, as troubled as they may be, if there is no ability to go into court and bring a lawsuit, you need to help that person have closure to whatever it is that has occurred. That can, they're on the seventh month of a six month arbitration process. And so in utilizing Six Sigma principles, that is, when the phone rings, the very same thing happens each time. We're able to determine at a very early stage whether or not that's a case that Edwards and Jennings wants to be involved in. I'm probably at the point now that I only take one case out of about 25, and it's just that not saying that the individual doesn't have a case, it's just that I can't take the case. And Deborah will tell you that many times a really good lawyer will pass on a really good case because they know what it's going to take to make that case come to fruition and they know they don't have the time or their staff doesn't have the time because another case is sitting in the office that has to get that time and eat that energy. <clears throat> when we think about theories of liability, you, you heard Deborah say, our theory of the case. One of the things I learned in law school and shortly thereafter in practice was that what is the theory of liability that we have here to help this person? Did they just go over to uh, the Civil Rights Department and file a complaint and then two weeks later they're terminated? Is this a retaliation case? Did they go to my OSHA and report something that was uh, poison in the workplace and then a month later get a discharge notice or some very profound retaliation occurring? Did the person, were they told, if you go along with me sexually, I'll take care of you. You'll go a long way in this uh, company. Just let's go out to dinner. Is that what happened? So immediately, you're, you're grabbing hold of the case, and you're, you're, is this a case in federal court, best brought in federal court? It's Americans with Disabilities, it's the Persons with Disability Michigan Law Best Place. 
Is this a wrongful discharge where the person actually had a written contract that said they couldn't be terminated except for cause for a period of three years or five years? There's a checklist that goes off in your head at a certain point. I mean, I wouldn't say it happens immediately, but certainly 15 years into practicing law and trying these type of cases, when you're first confronted with a potential employee, you begin to think about the theory of liability. When the employer, employee calls your office, they have one thing on their mind, and that is, I need to fix this. My life is coming apart. There's generally a huge hum emotional component. I was previously a psychiatric social worker, so many times I can sit and talk with the client for the first time and note various emotional issues going on. There's a tremor in their voice. There's a inability to remember things. They can't concentrate or they just break down and cry. And this is the, the profundity of doing this kind of work and the reason why you not only have to love the law, but you have to like people. Don't go into employment discrimination litigation if you really like to, you know, tax. Don't do it. Because it's a whole different it is uh, arms around the client uh, emotionally and uh, theoretically type of practice. So the client comes in, you talk with them, you tell them you've got to sign this fee agreement. Not only that, you may have to pay for some of the experts in the case. If they've been terminated and they went from making 50000 a year or 20000 a year, or 250000 because they're vice president, That's, it doesn't matter. Suddenly, their income has been altered. So I say, you know, you are going to probably have to hire a CPA to do the economic damages in your case. You have damages that consist of both wage loss, you have a 401k, there was a, uh, a standard pension program, you, you could contribute, they could contribute, so there's any level of discussion that goes on around framing the attorney-client contract. Some clients say, I just don't have any money, Ms. Jennings. <laughs> and that's where my partner, Carl Edwards, and I sometimes, we, we kind of fall out a little bit because at any given time in the office, there are clients that we're paying all of the costs of. And that's because this civil rights litigation and this human rights litigation is why I went to law school. I did not go to make a lot of money. Incidentally, along the way, many of us trial lawyers who went into employment law did make a lot of money. But that was not why we do this work. I, I really don't think for people standing in the courtroom, they don't do it for money. Maybe a few. So the client signs the fee agreement. You explain to them that this is going to take some time. Many employers, employees come in and they think they come see a lawyer, they, they sign up, they, if there's money to go into the trust, they pay it, and, and it's going to happen. No, it may take two years just to get through the state court process, or 18 months to get through the federal court process. And then there's the issue of winning, losing, and the question of appeal that itself could take two to three years going to the Supreme Court of the State of Michigan or the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. And so all of that to 
really give the client a sense of what to expect is important to share with them at that point. We start on discovery, and I'm mindful of that I've got only about five more minutes. This is where you make your case in discovery so that you can stand in front of a jury and hold up a document. We have tools of the trade. They include requests for production of documents. Uh, Jessica will tell you just Friday, I was in court in front of Judge John Gillis on a motion to compel where the defendants had attempted to sandbag me and not give me the criterion documents that were used to make the decision about a promotion. In fact, there were, were no postings, so there was a round table of all white directors that sat around, executive directors, and they talked about John, Mary, and Sue, and decided who could get promoted. Well, it was little wonder that every single person, practically, that came out of that for promotion to manager was Caucasian and younger. My client, a 58-year-old uh, African-American female, had been with the company for 38 years, could not get promoted. She had that concrete ceiling over her head. So they play games, they play games, they play more games. I went before Judge Gillis and I said, Judge, they're playing games. They're, they're sandbagging me. They're bored discovery, and I need this stuff because I have to have it to meet my burden of proof. So Judge Gillis awarded every single item that they had been deep sixing and lying about and told them, you've got 21 days to produce it. And Ms. Jennings, if they don't produce it, you come back and I'll enter an order and some sanctions against them. That's how discovery works. It's not just sending out the initial request for interrogatories or the initial request for request for production. They will sandbag you every time. They will deny you what you need if you don't already have it or you need more of it. And a little used tool is called a request to admit. Sometimes the defendants have already admitted, admitted some liability in a case. And you send that request to them. The defendant admits that from the year 2014 to present, they have not promoted one African American into the position of manager. That is, that's important because that's coming out of their, straight up from their mouth, from the mouth of the the uh, employer. We may need to subpoena third parties. They, oh, John was so qualified. I mean, he had been a director at so-and-so company, and we needed his kind of person because he's such a sharp thinker. Well, you subpoena John's records, and you find out, well, he wasn't such a sharp thinker, and in fact, John had been terminated or had to go find a job in lieu of termination. So sometimes a third party subpoena, in some instances a FOIA request from a federal agency, and then the absolute caviar of our discovery, depositions. Those depositions, I'm telling you, that's where you win your case if you can't win it other ways. Because nine times out of nine, the defendants will come in line. I don't even think they talk to each other. They come in, they, they sit down and, good morning, hello, how are you? Very well, thank you. And then, right off the top, lies after lies after lies. And so, when you're ready to do a case evaluation, you're ready to uh, do motions in limine, you're ready to win that motion for summary judgment, you've got all these contradictions. They said Mary Smith could not 
do uh, anything on a computer, and she's Oracle uh, savvy, she knows everything. I mean, sometimes they don't even get ready, and, and you heard that from Deborah. So it's the depositions that, for us at Edwards and Jennings, they made the case every time. And so as we pull everything together, my client is my co-captain. They're sitting right next to me. They're, they can look at a document, document. They see something I can't see. I'm not a chemical engineer. I'm not one of the, on the GM design team. They can look at something and say, well, you know, this should just look at this. This shows that so-and-so, so-and-so. And I'm saying, does it? I, well, good. Let's use it. And so I, I just want to kind of wrap up here with the uh, anticipating the motion for summary judgment. When the client calls me, I'm anticipating the motion for summary judgment right then. When the client comes in to meet with me, I'm anticipating that motion for summary judgment right then, because that's the end of the case unless you win an appeal. And so as you work through the case, from the moment that client calls your office to the first meeting with that client, and sometimes I don't file a case until I've met with the client five times, They've come to know me. I have them call in their witnesses. I want to eyeball that witness. I want to see if that witness is going to have any credibility. I want to see if that witness can stand up against my cross-examination to them, even as they're sitting there drinking some Hawaiian coffee, you see. And so all of this is part and parcel of what trial lawyers do as they plan employment discrimination litigation. I hope this has been helpful to you and appreciate your being here. Thank you both. Uh, this has really been perfect. This is exactly what the I Couldn't Code lecture is all about. I suspect that I and Dennis hearing this talk have a lot of memories of the way their father tried cases. Uh, we have some time. Uh, speaking, we saw how effective lawyers can make a great presentation in a limited period of time. Academics often don't do as well. We need to learn that. But, um, we have time. We officially have to end of 120 because some of us, myself included, have a 125 class. But to the extent that our speakers can hang around a little bit afterwards if they can. Some of you who don't have class can uh, perhaps ask a bit more. But we have time for questions. I'll recognize you. Just speak loudly. Go ahead.
But I try to myself, you know what, it, it's fine, it works fine. I schlep my boxes, my banker's boxes, into the federal building by myself. I park the car and run in. And one other funny quick story. Um, many years ago, I tried a case, Jones Day came in from Chicago. And, you know, they threatened me, Alice, I'm sure you know this, they threatened me, you know, we're going to offer you $50,000, that's a lot of money. Oh, really? Okay. And then we can go to work, so here's what you guys need to know. The plaintiff always sits closest to the jury. This is the jury. This is my table. It's written in stone. I get to court that morning. Guess where Jones Day is sitting? Oh, yes, they are, Larry. They are right there. And this makes me realize these people have literally never tried a case. And all their bluster. Now I'm, hi, this is the plaintiff's table. And they're like, you know, we're here. We're here now. We're not moving. Okay, the clerk's over there. Uh, hi, Deanna, whatever, you know, whoever the clerk was. Could you just let them know? She's like, are they sitting over there? <laughs> she hustles over and they move. And then the next day, they literally brought in 40 bankers' boxes. They had a team of men that brought in 40 bankers' boxes and lined them up in the back of the courtroom. I'm not making this up, guys. By the end of the trial, I still wonder what the frig is in those bankers' boxes. And they haven't been used during this trial. But they were a big corporate firm. This is how they roll. They bring every possible document, 10 copies of each. You know, you can make it happen all by yourself. You really can. I don't know if Alice has got anything to add to that or not. This is where I'm going to Just, just briefly, just briefly to add, 90% uh, of the time I am, it's a David and Goliath syndrome. Which we like. Which we like. Uh, but in class actions like, uh, uh, we have been involved in multiple class actions, both uh, environmental justice cases where race was involved, as well as civil rights litigation. Um, and so there may be 10 plaintiff's lawyers and 20 defense lawyers. Uh, it doesn't really make a difference, I don't think, to the jury, because they usually can see right through BS. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, since the uh, marriage, uh, the uh, expansion of marriage equality, have you seen an increase in employment discrimination cases against um, sexual orientation and gender identity? Well, listen, there is no protection for gay people yes. in the state of Michigan, right. period, full stop. I've been getting calls on this issue for a really long time, and it's always very sad to have to say the same with the person calling who's experienced direct discrimination. I'm sorry, Michigan hasn't gotten around to amending the Allied Arts and Civil Rights Act, the Tester Center, I'm sure can speak to this, uh, to include employment. So there is no law, federal or state. There is law. Yes. reputation in the world, 
but if somebody, a mom and pa on the corner who just started practicing in this area has a great web, web presence and does advertising, you know, the playing field is now level. So that's huge. But I still have to go with reputation at the end of the day to get the good cases, you know, the good cases that, that people are, you know, with it enough to ask around and get names and find out who does what. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. You, you, can, you can launch yourselves out there now, you guys, with uh, an internet presence in a way you never could before. I just wanted to uh, say about uh, the gay quality. I know that the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Commission and the Michigan Department of Civil Rights are taking cases based on sexual stereotyping. Right. And so they how far that's going to go is whether gender case again. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's just that little bit of life that's going on with that. Um, the cases come from reputation, but also going we, out into the community and speaking, whether it's a church or it's a union hall or some other uh, community-driven process. Uh, we've been involved with something called the People's Law School which started with MTLA uh, and some of the work that uh, will immediately put you in front of large groups of people. And then when you have kids, now I'm getting kids from cases from my kids' friends yeah. who are now newly into the workforce. And so they come from all kinds of different ways, including being at a party or something that, oh, you're a lawyer. Well, this is what's going on with <laughs> me. Yes, sir. Um, I was just wondering uh, how you deal with, since there's uh, no protection for LGBT, but there's other protections, when a case has both protectable and unprotectable elements, how you sort of deal with that intersection. The reason why I ask is because Professor Sutter said specifically you had dealt with a women's basketball coach. My undergrad university has had a big scandal where the uh, athletic director has been replacing women's coaches with men's coaches somewhat systematically, and it appears to be both on gender and on sexuality issues. Are they replacing um, all women coaches yeah, with male women coaches, coaches of women's, women's sports? Of women's sports, yeah. yes. So my case that Professor Settler mentioned was a fun one. It was a while ago. Things have changed not much. Uh, my client was the varsity, was the uh, girls varsity coach. Um, and, and then she was at Hazel Park, and then she was the boys' JV coach, and she'd done that for 20 years, and when the boys' varsity position opened, they leapfrogged over her to go to the boys' freshman coach, who had one year, one year of basketball coaching experience. So the judge, actually, this is the other thing we didn't get a chance to talk about, Al. We can ask for equitable relief. We asked Judge Steve in the Federal District Court put my client into the boys' varsity position, and he did it. And the school district was damned if they were going to have a woman, but you know what? And three jurors went to the opening game. Now, to answer your question, uh, you can't do anything about it. If, if, it's, if, it's not a protect, if you're not in a protected category, that's how we refer to the discrimination world, you fall into a protected category. If you're not in a protected category, there really isn't any way to meld things together. And I would be very careful about trying to do that because you can um, harm yourself. If the jury ends up thinking, oh, the real reason she didn't get selected is because she's a gay, that may be your underlying case where you're trying to argue it's gender.
as well as the legislative process. So get a team, it only takes a team of four or five committed people to start working on legislation that would provide the type of protections and then to start working it. Doesn't mean you're gonna get it in one year or five years, it may take 15 years before actual legislation comes to four. But it's got to start with someone understanding the issues and then putting it into our state legislative bodies as well as our um, federal. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I wanted to know if you take a case that actually gets to the trial stage, what things do you consider when you're choosing your jury? Yeah, that's always that's always it. That's always the question. And I'll tell you what happens. You have such limited time. You're sitting there, they're, you know, in the box, or they're being kicked in the box. Plaintiff goes first. I have three preemptory challenges after the challenges for cause, and the judge is sitting up there, wait, you know, waiting. And you have such a little sense of these people. You, voir dire is really important. I, I'm a firm believer that people are people. And, you know, you can come in with your stereotypes, but they'll only take you so far with regard to what people do for a living and that they live. You just have to try your best to, to drill down on questioning them and developing a rapport with that person and seeing whether they're willing to be open-minded. Um, I don't have any magic secret sauce. I'm, I, I just don't. Um, obviously, if I'm in, you know, in a race case, I'm not going to want probably older white males on there. I've also got kind of a bias against young people at times because I, I've noticed that they don't maybe have the life experience to know what it feels like to go through some of the stuff on the job. I mean, so life experience is a factor. I don't know if Alice has a secret sauce she wants to share with us. I'd love to hear. You know what, if I, I can interrupt, I mean, I've had a couple trials recently where the judges don't even let us ask questions. The, the judges these days, I, maybe it's been always, but the older you get, the more irritating it is. You know, they, they want to control the whole thing, and they, you know, it's all about, let's, let's hurry up. It's not like, this is a one time and place where this person has a chance to get some justice. It's like, you know what, we got we to gotta roll through this. I'm going to ask the questions. Now I'm really in trouble. Uh, you just have to use your instincts and see what's unfolding in front of you and do the best you can. That's, that's all I got to offer now. Other questions or so? Okay, let me just thank uh, our panel so much. I mean, this, I cannot tell you how effective this was. Uh, I think you all learned a great deal about lawyering and the argument in the Cone Lecture about trials. So let me thank both of you again.